I call uh, Chris Farfoy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair. Um, and can I thank um, uh, the Honourable Nathan Guy for uh, taking a call earlier in this bill. Uh, he was um, very noble to um, uh, the uh, chairperson of the Government Administration Select Committee, Ruth Dyson, the Honourable Ruth Dyson, saying that the committee had done a lot of work on the bill and good, the good work was being done by the Select Committee. It was a call because that Select Committee fixed the bill. It actually uh, made a, a raft of changes uh, within this bill and, uh, uh, and, abso and absolutely improved the bill. So uh, Mr, Mr Guy was, should be thankful for the fact that the Select Committee uh, looked through the bill and made a, a number of significant uh, changes to it. Mr Chair, I did um, want to talk to Part 2 and specifically Clause number 8, uh, 9, 8. Uh, which gives an example um, that for the purposes of um, subsection sub 6 and 7 of clause 9 that identity information may be treated as consistent with recorded information despite any variation between them because of pronunciation or punctuation. And it gives um, an example here uh, within the bill. And I just wanted to give a personal example because on my driver's licence here, my surname is spelled F-A apostrophe A F-O-Y. But because of the trouble that the apostrophe uh, has uh, caused our family, we decided to, when we're using it uh, on a daily basis, to get rid of uh, the apostrophe because on my passport it says apostrophe A uh, and when we've booked tickets to go overseas um, the, the ticket agent has removed the apostrophe so we've actually had instances where we've turned up uh, to check in for the flight and we've said no you can't check in your passport says one thing and your ticket says another just because uh, there's a, an apostrophe within uh, the, the official document and the ticket has, has not had an apostrophe so uh, that has been an issue uh, for us so it's good to see that uh, a practical uh, implication of this bill in clause 9.8 uh, is going to let uh, a, little le a little bit of leeway and um, you know for the likes of accents and hyphenations uh, which are within clause 9.8 so the Farfoy family the Farfoy family will be very very happy about that. Um, I also wanted um, to talk about clause number seven um, and that is um, around the uh, introduction of uh, intermediaries and we think that um, as I said before um, when I was commenting on the good work done by the Government Administration Select Committee that this is a very good improvement um, because the intermediary, intermediaries will offer greater convenience and uh, reduce compliance costs for those involved. And I did, uh, during um, this debate, ask Ruth Dyson whether or not uh, maybe members of Parliament uh, could be considered as intermediaries because from time to time uh, we do have people that come into our electorate offices um, to, so we can act um, as witnesses and confirm their documentation. So that may have some implications uh, for um, uh, uh, members of parliament in terms of acting as intermediaries, as um, has been pointed out uh, throughout part two of, of this bill. Uh, and Mr Chair, I also wanted to have a quick look at clause uh, 17. Uh, which pertains to the Privacy Commissioner and uh, the fact that they may require periodic reports on the operation of this confirmation system. Uh, and uh, 17 itself says, it's very short, I'll read it out for you, the Privacy Commissioner may at intervals not shorter than 12 months require the responsible officials to provide the Privacy Commissioner with a report on the operation of the confirmation service. And I just do want to go back to um, part one of the bill and to clause four, uh, the purpose um, 4B, uh, where um, it says that um, uh, we should ensure that agencies can use and if necessarily record confirmed, conf record confirmed identity information. And I think that we should also have a look at inserting a word there or uh, some action taken to put securely um, record confirmed identity information because as we've seen uh, in recent months, Mr uh, Chair, there have been a number of privacy breaches uh, within a number of government agencies that have um, caused great concern to members of the public. Uh, firstly, uh, the, the privacy breach at Work and Income New Zealand, uh, where uh, a citizen journalist, Keith Ng, was able to access a kiosk that was freely available to any member of the public. Um, he strolled into uh, he strolled into uh, one of these offices and uh, got out a USB stick and pretty much helped himself to 7,000 documents of very sensitive information uh, pertaining to um, suicide cases, to medical records, to invoices for contractors and the like. Uh, and um, I think most New Zealanders were aghast at the level of information that he was able to get his hands on at a, at a publicly available kiosk in a work and income 
uh, office. Um, and I think uh, Clause 17, Mr Chair. Um, Chris Chair. Farfoy. Uh, thank you. Mr Chair, I think Clause 17, to give the ability of the Privacy Commissioner to ask for a report, uh, uh, certainly would uh, help in monitoring those kinds of privacy breaches uh, that we've seen in the likes of Work and Income uh, New Zealand. Uh, Mr Chair, unfortunately Work and Income New Zealand is not the only um, instance of, of a privacy breach that Clause 17 may be useful for uh, in, in the future. Uh, we've also had um, the account of uh, the Inland Revenue Department, and I believe, and I, I may stand corrected and I may hear it from behind me, uh, that 6,300 individuals uh, have been affected in the last year uh, by breaches of privacy uh, by the Inland Revenue Department. Now, this is a department that and doesn't like it when um, taxpayers get things wrong, uh, but uh, in the last 12 months, the fact that 6,300 individuals have been affected by privacy breaches uh, is not a good look. And I think uh, if the Inland Revenue Department were to be part of uh, this at some stage in the future to help um, uh, verify uh, identification, I think the fact that Clause 17 would be there to allow the Privacy Commissioner to proactively look at any breaches of of privacy uh, would be a good thing. Unfortunately, Mr Chair, it doesn't stop there. Uh, we've also got the case of um, the Accident Compensation Corporation, which I believe um, gave 6,748, uh, the details of 6,748 individuals uh, to one member of the public who went public uh, in a big way uh, and obviously caused a whole heap of ructions on the other side of the House. But, Mr Chair, that, that is, uh, again, another government agency that is dealing with very sensitive information and it managed to release a lot of information of nearly 7,000 individuals in one email. Uh, so Clause 17, Mr Chair, that would allow uh, the Privacy Commissioner to look into that uh, uh, whenever uh, he or she wanted to would be uh, is, is a good um, um, part of, of what's contained uh, in this bill. Unfortunately, Mr Chair, that is not where it ends. Uh, we've also got the Ministry of Education uh, with Novapay and the fact that a number of um, teachers have had their uh, private details or their pay details released to schools that they do not work at uh, is another breach of privacy. Uh, and, uh, of course, um, this is of, grave of, of much concern uh, to the public. Uh, and Clause 17 within this bill, uh, Mr Chair, would obviously give the Privacy Commissioner uh, some leeway to proactively look into uh, those privacy breaches. So we're painting a bit of a picture here, Mr Chair, um, that there is serious concern uh, in the public about the, the level of security around information and the trust in which government departments uh, that the public have and, and whether they can be trusted with uh, the security of this information. Uh, uh, the current state of affairs, I think, if you were to ask uh, the members of the public, would be that uh, there is serious concern. Um, but I think uh, that a provision like Clause 17 uh, in Part 2 of this bill would put um, some of those um, fears at ease in the fact that the Privacy Commissioner could proactively look um, at any potential breaches or actual breaches of privacy within, these, um, within uh, the realm of this bill. Because, Mr Chair, our privacy is very important. Uh, uh, and, of course, it is um, the confidence of the New Zealand public and the uh, and the government agencies to hold uh, private information uh, secure, uh, which um, gives us a level of confidence in their ability to do their basic functions. And I think it's fair to say that in the last year or so, we've seen on a number of instances, cases where the confidence uh, of the New Zealand public has been pretty much rocked uh, by what has, has gone on. And I think probably the worst case uh, that we've seen in the last 12 months is that of uh, Work and Income New Zealand uh, and where that information was so easily accessed. Mr Chair, we will uh, and we are uh, supporting this bill. Um, I'd like to thank um, whoever drafted Clause 9.8 uh, and thank you for the pain that, the, that, has, uh, that will ease the pain that uh, I have felt for many years over a single apostrophe <laughs> in our name and also um, thank um, the work of the Government Administration Select Committee for doing a lot of work to uh, tidy up this bill uh, from the state in which it arrived into the Parliament. Members, uh, we come to the vote on part two, but first we have the amendment in the name of Jan Logie. This is set out on SOP number 148. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion will say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Party votes called for. I'll ask the clerk for a party vote.
New Zealand National. 59 votes opposed. New Zealand Labor. 34 opposed. Green Party. 14 in favour. New Zealand First. 8 votes in favour. Māori Party. 3 votes opposed. Mana. 1 vote in favour. Act New Zealand. Vote opposed. United Future. One vote opposed. Members, the ayes are 23, the noes are 98. The amendment is not agreed to. The question is that part two stand part. Those of that opinion will say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is that the schedule stand part. Those of that opinion will say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that clauses one and two stand part. The question is that clause one stand part. Those of that opinion will say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is that clause two stand part. Those of that opinion will say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I will report this bill without amendment presently. <coughs> Members, we now uh, we move now to the legislation bill, and we'll continue the debate.